This is Control Structure, episode 116 for October 5th, 2016. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs116 to see, to see them. Uh, I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Beep! I guess he's unavailable. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So, um, yeah, it's uh, another episode. Man, that kind of went fast, I think. What, the 116? Well, I guess it wouldn't do no, all it would, of them. It would, be, it would be since 115 to 116. Uh, you on episode 15 when I started? When you joined the show? I'm trying to... I, I think it was like more around episode 50. Okay, that, that sounds about right, yeah. So, like, I'm just saying, like, it seems like last week we did a show. Oh, I see. Okay, you have the one one fifty. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it does seem like last week. I I told someone at work today. They were saying, "But wow, you, it's already two weeks now, or something like that." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm here to remind you, your life's speeding by." <laughs> so, um, yeah, last Thursday, like I was just kind of sick, and like it must have been like some kind of cold, and it was like Tuesday and Wednesday that Jeff, uh, you met him at the uh, party. He sits, like, right uh, in front of me, sort of. Okay. And, like, Tuesday and Wednesday, he was just kind of coughing. Uh-huh. Like, I was kind of feeling it Wednesday, and then Thursday, I wake up, and, uh, yeah, it's not happening today. So I take a sick day Thursday, and uh, so, uh, like, some of it's still residual, but I think it's, like, all over, so... I had a cold uh, three, four weeks ago, so probably it was that strain, so hopefully... Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe not. I'm assuming you're not contagious, too, so... <laughs> so, um, well, I'm definitely not coughing profusely. Yeah, you don't sound sick. Yeah, so, uh, anywho, there's that, and then, uh, yeah, it looks like this week is going to be all clear, so I can use the tea all this week. Very nice. Yes. Do you plan on going back to driving in the winter time? Uh, maybe. See, partway to me, that I could see the tea being nice in those very icy wintery days, as long as you can walk down. Yeah. Just because, guess what? You don't have to crash your car into an electric pole or something. Yeah, but I can, like, slip on the way walking downhill. It's true, you could slip on the way walking downhill. <coughs> I guess sla- sidewalks tend to be more icier. Whereas if it was just fields, it wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. So, um, let's see, there's that. And then, uh, yeah, I can, you know, it's still sufficiently warm enough to bike on the weekends, so I'm doing that still. So, uh, anyways, uh, Google released an iPhone, and it seemed like there was much rejoicing. Yay! Apparently, uh, they said it's more expensive than the Nexus, and so they're... They're uh, getting upwards of Apple and, uh, I believe, Samsung. They men- mentioned it price-wise. Yeah. So, so, so Google released the Pixel and Pixel XL. And I guess, you know, we're sort of obliged to do this since the uh, the gadget show uh, is no longer in, uh, I guess, uh, in production at this point. But, uh, yeah, it seemed like, uh, well, just... I, since I just know the other people on this network, one, if not two, other people on this network will be getting one of these. Yes. <laughs> because they're all Google fiends. So, um, yeah. These things kind of look like iPhones, but they have headphone jacks. They're not an iPhone because it has a headphone jack. <laughs> Blackberry, 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 Blackberry. A somewhat considerate of your neighbors across the road, because I'm pretty sure still no one's in there yet. There's a rent sign. I guess the across the next block over the guy out. The, the, his the, dog. The, oh, there. You, are you talking about the one over there or the one across the street? Well, both of them are empty, actually. I yeah. Think. yeah. So, so, um, and even if we yell really loud. 
I don't think that anybody in the house across the street would know. Would know, or maybe they'd, so. they'd be annoyed and then just go on with their life and forget about us. Because we do it every two weeks, and they're like, oh, there's those crazy guys over wait, there again. Wait, wait, did we say Blackberry? We should say something berry. Well, um, again, because the Gadget Show is no longer in production, and uh, because I sort of ripped off the time that we say raspberry from them, uh, the original Blackberry, um, apparently they're no longer doing phones anymore. Uh, this has been, they've been sort of hinting at this for a while, that uh, they're getting out of the uh, manufacturing phones kind of thing stuff. They found out the software is uh, more profitable for them, so. At least right now. At least right now. It was actually interesting the other day. I forget what I was doing, but I was doing something physical. Oh, I remember what it was. It was with my car and the whole thing of fixing it and stuff. I was like, with software, you try something, and if it doesn't work, you just delete it and go back and try something else. But with your car, when something doesn't work, you can't just delete the car and go back to what you had before. <laughs> well, if if you're poor like us, you yeah, can't. It's true. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you had sufficient money, I'm I, pretty sure you could delete a car. I suppose you could delete a car if it's sufficient <laughs> money. Go get my big laser. <laughs> my laser. <laughs> Can you do that again? Go get my big laser. <laughs> Raspberry? Raspberry? Raspberry! Raspberry! <laughs> Raspberry, that's so much better. <laughs> so, apparently, all this time, while I've been hacking away in the terminal using headless pies, apparently the Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspbian, has been getting a facelift, face lift, and actually looks kind of modern and nice now, not the old old style Linux like hey I'm Linux and I'm free and I'm not user friendly and I look like I came from the 90s <laughs> so it, 90s 90s or 80s you mean yeah 80s, 80s. <laughs> it, it's still not like Windows Vista pretty but it's it's at least like XP pretty I'd say uh, but it's not bad they, they include a few desktop backgrounds which isn't that hard to do yeah but still uh, probably the most notable feature is now instead of showing you scrolling text on boot up, they instead show you a nice splash screen and yes. the version number, which I think the version number is super valuable and they said they had gotten requests about version numbers. So that's good. Uh, so good job to them for actually uh, uh, working to improve it. And apparently they named it Pixel uh, because they made significant changes and now Pi uh, feels like they, they, they have enough to warrant a name. Yeah, so they, it looks like they uh, sort of increased or maybe decreased the DPI, so now everything's a little bit bigger. It does look a bit bigger, yeah. So, um, yeah, headless pie. That seems unnecessarily violent. I just like to take my pies out the back door and make them headless. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... <clears throat> Meanwhile, back uh, in the 1980s with uh, text mode, uh, uh, Microsoft has decided that it has had enough with the limited color palette of Bash, and with the Windows subsystem for Linux, has decided to implement full 24-bit color. So now you can have uh, your text and your blocks be extremely smooth shades of color. So now we can go back to play retro games on the command line and... Also, uh, I haven't used it in a long time, but that web browser for the terminal, I wonder if you could hack it. Do you like show Lynx? Like picture? I forget if it was Lynx I used. One time, my one friend, I was just like joking, and I had like the you know the web browser up in the terminal. I've been playing with it, and he's like, but you can't use Facebook with that. <laughs> so I, I went and tried to access Facebook, and they're like, oh, you have to have like Firefox or Chrome to use us. So I was like, okay. So I just went ahead and told the browser, browser agent that, hey, guess what? I'm Firefox. <laughs> yeah. So look at me at Firefox. And so Facebook then let me in because I said I was Firefox, so obviously I'm Firefox. Yeah, and like uh, like if if you weren't Firefox, so I would say you were a Firefox. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So it just let me right in, and I was able to post on his wall, like, challenge accepted or something. <laughs> so yeah, you can post to Facebook through the terminal. Posted by not Firefox. Posted by not Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So after their breach was fully publicized, Dropbox has explained in rather excruciating detail how they store, I mean, do, passwords. So they mentioned uh, one of the things they do is they encrypt it so that they can rotate their... Uh... So, so they do a per-user salt in what they call a global pepper. So... Uh, like since they're sort of in charge of the pepper part, and that is also the outer layer uh, of the uh, storage, they can actually decrypt these hashes and encrypt them with another key if they so choose. So um, there's like a per user level, and then there's a global level of uh, storage as well. Um so the the thing that I sort of don't like with this is that before it goes through the salt and the pepper, they uh, run an SHA-512 over the uh, password, which I'm not exactly sure why they do it. To me, it seems like they are decreasing entropy when they do that. So since like an SHA-512 only has a fixed uh, amount of entropy in it, like, you're sort of reducing that from the original password. Meaning that other passwords may also fit the same hash and, you're going yeah, to take it to. Granted, SHA-512 is like 512 bits. Uh, there is still a very remote possibility that there is a collision, that there could be a collision with that. But, um, like, what if I want more than 512 bits of entropy in my password? It's... It sure. kind of limits that. So, um, all in all, it seems fairly fairly good. So, you know, it means that not only will you have to, you know, know the global secret, you also need to know the per user secret as well. The the question on Stack Overflow was: Are there any known collisions for the hash functions? Uh, the first answer is, in short, no, and. Yeah, SHA1 is kind of broken. It's a brute force. It's the N divided by 2. Where N is the bit length of the output. So that would be... 512 divided by 2, so that would be 2 due to 256. Oh, V divided by 2. Already from 256. It would be a lot. A lot. So that sounds like a Wolfram <laughs> Alpha number, because it might give a good graph or something, or say, hey, this is how many people in the world, and this is how big your number is, and this is how many planets are in the solar system, and that's how big your number was that you gave us. So let's see what Wolfram Alpha says. I'm pretty sure that there's not 2 to the 256 of anything in the universe. Maybe photons, but that might be wrong. There could be a lot of stars out there. It is, you know... 78 decimal digits. Okay. And apparently it does have a name, but I'm not going to pronounce it, so I'll let you do that Quatoravigentillion. It's quite a name. <laughs> it's yeah. worse than Google. <laughs> um, put the uh, Stack Exchange thing stack in the... Stack Exchange thing. Yes, so now it's an official part of the show now that I've Googled it in... Oh, you stuck well, exchange, not the Wolfram Alpha. There you go. Well, you can put the Wolfram Alpha in there anyway. We, we, we can do that as well. Uh, lose the Dropbox one. No. Go on. Google, thank you. That wasn't helpful at all. <laughs> so, um, now that you've uh, dropped that one down. Uh, so, a 1.1 terabit denial of service attack occurred last week. Uh, it seems that most of it ha came from hacked... IoT things, IoT devices, uh, especially uh, like this one brand of uh, uh, internet camera. Yes. That's manufactured by this Chinese company. And apparently with Telnet, is this the article that mentioned that? Um, well, it's like still like the same kind of idea. So yes, yeah. uh, apparently these cameras use Telnet. So. Like, you can just break in there without any kind of uh, restraint. And this is the funny thing. Way back when, when I was in high school, I had a book, a computer book, that was older and had gone through a few revisions. that just warned people, just don't use Telnet. It's just a bad idea. Uh, let me guess, that book was like probably from the 80s or something? It, it wasn't that old, but it had been through like one or two revisions. 
It was a newer ish book that you could tell had been updated. But so, it wasn't too terrible. So you in high school, so that would have been two thousand seven ish. Ish, yeah. Ish. So so at that point SSH would have been available for a few years, but at that point, like even sort of insecure SSH. I th- I, th- I think there were other options at the time for sure. It's funny thinking time wise how how technology has changed. So um the uh, founder of this web host that got uh, DOSed said that the attack had used IoT devices to mount an attack using hacked closed circuits TV cameras and personal video recorders. Um, so let's see. Da-da-da. Only a few years ago, the only devices in your home were laptops, tablets, and phones connected to the internet. Now add in fridges, thermostats, DVR, security cameras, and light bulbs. So if you were the owner of this great bot army, could you mind forget bitcoins and do quite well? Um, with the minuscule power of these devices, I don't think so. They're really small, but think about how many of them there are. The trick would be to balance it so that the users don't notice you've got a mining rig on their camera. Yeah. Even then, like, you can just buy, like, a little box for, like, a hundred bucks and, like, chew through, like, all the algorithms and stuff much faster than a thousand of these could. The point is, though, this guy didn't buy them. He borrowed them. Well, yeah, but there are other things that you can do with hacked IoT things. Like DDoS attacks and demand well, ransoms. Well, maybe even a little bit further than that. So... Uh, if you, uh, are an aspiring, uh, script kitty and would like to have your own bot army, uh, you can probably easily do so since the toolkit that was, that had compromised all of these devices had, had, uh, is now open source. Uh, well, Go open source, well, open source figuratively. Anyway, the source has been leaked anyway, uh, I guess would be the proper term. So, uh, yeah, it, there is kind of evidence that, uh, this can infect a device and patch it. So like another competing botnet cannot take control of it. Which is pretty neat. And see, it's like doing a good thing for the world. It's, it's <laughs> patching, it's patching security flaws and devices. That was actually when I was really little. Uh, that was a thought I had. So what if you wrote a computer virus that installed a virus scanner? <laughs> so in other words, if you're dumb enough to not have antivirus software on your computer and you get infected by my virus, then my virus will act as the virus scanner for your computer and scan it. <laughs> not that I ever built it, but anyway. <laughs> that was an idea I had once a long time ago. Uh, so the Mirai source code was uh, posted to hack forums by a user. Uh, Krebs said that the leaker provided the following explanation. When I first go into the DDoS industry, I wasn't planning on staying in it long. I made money. There's lots of eyes looking at IoT now. So now it's time to GTFO. So today, I have an amazing release for you. Uh, With Mirai, I usually pull max 380k bots from Telnet alone. However, after the Kreb DDoS, ISPs have been slowly shutting down and cleaning up their act. Today, max pull is about 300,000 and dropping. So, um, it seems that ISPs are somehow, uh, like notifying users and turning users off and saying that, um, Hey, there's something, uh, compromised in your house. Uh, can you please disconnect all of your like little, you know, novelty devices (laughs) and we'll reconnect you. Um, so another thing that has been floated around in comment threads is that, you know, what if, you know, you are a IoT manufacturer and you want to, like, sort of increase your market. So you hire someone to hack all these IoT devices because they have such weak security to hack all of these IoT devices and break them. So people will uh-huh. want to go out and buy more IoT things. Interesting. So they will hopefully buy your things and 
maybe they would be more secure. That would probably encourage security. If one competitor realizes the other competitor is doing it, obviously they're going to retaliate. And so now you've got to have good protection. I think that would drive the industry to be more secure. Yeah. So uh, another another point is that uh, you know, like, there's really no uh, aside from that. There's really no uh, how should I say uh, encouragement uh, for better security on these things. Um, so uh, it's like going to go along like this until like some large entity is going to sue a manufacturer for releasing all of these horribly insecure devices that's launching attacks against them. That's true if you could prove like a certain level was the threshold and your company was to blame for being very sloppy. Yes. Um, so that's that's like probably, you know, one obvious way that this would go down. So, yeah, things are going to get a little dangerous uh, from here on out. So another reason why corporate security is so bad is that it turns out that it's cheaper to deal with a compromise than to pay for proper security and countermeasures. So uh, uh, this is likened to the Ford Pinto situation where they calculated, it's like, okay, well, how much will the recall cost versus how much like actual damages would occur if we didn't? So, and it turns out that they thought that they could, you know, financially get away with uh, not recalling things, but then the memo uh, revealing this information got leaked, and uh, they had to recall it anyway. I'd say the thing that kind of got them into problems was uh, it said that it would only cost them 180 deaths, but it was going to cost them... 49 million versus 30, 137 million. So obviously it's better to take the 180 deaths. So, and this was back in 1973. So money was worth a little bit more back then. That's true. Uh, but we uh, don't need to be so insecure uh, as we were back then because we now have Let's Encrypt. Uh, it's taking the SSL, quote, marketplace, unquote, by storm. But the other big certificate authorities are getting bigger, too. Uh, so with all the recent, you know, uh, rush towards encryption, uh, at least web encryption, that is, that uh, everyone's, you know, moving towards it. Uh, so, like, there's, you know, statistics that uh, say that the number of SSL secured websites has bumped up from 30.7, uh, or rather, say or rather 37% to 44.9. So that's like quite a bit of a jump. Lots of people are taking advantage of it. The interesting thing was it mentioned a lot of a uh, jump of uh, expired certificates. I uh, I think it was 0.2% to 0.9%. Yeah. Uh, and it was just saying that because they had the three month cycle, probably it's easier for people to- Yeah, for Let's, encrypt, the, yeah. For Let's encrypt specifically. Yeah. Uh, or at least that's that's one of the reasons for the uptick anyway. Um, so, like, they realized that the, uh, uh, like, their methodology of counting the Let's Encrypt certificates uh, was a little bit flawed because uh, the general uh, certification path goes to uh, IDIN Trust rather than to the Let's Encrypt root certificate uh, because the Let's Encrypt intermediate certificate is signed obviously by let's encrypt but the let's encrypt root is not trusted by most browsers but it is by iden trust and iden trust has signed their intermediate so um like they also present a little chart here you know by number of sites and their traffic and uh like what is the average of each uh ca which i thought was a little bit interesting so uh, but uh, it looks like uh, the other CA market shares will go up because Mozilla is considering to drop to drop Startcom and Wosign, uh, uh roots from, well, obviously Mozilla. And if Mozilla does it, then likely uh, other uh, browser vendors and uh, operating systems will too. So the uh, the center of this is a little problem that Wosign had 
uh, in that, uh, like, you know, how you can get a certificate for your base domain, like, for instance, theandrewbailey.com, and also for subdomains like www.andrewbailey.com or blog.andrewbailey.com or what have you. Um, so uh, someone actually got a certificate uh, for one of their like little github.io domains. Uh-huh. And for some reason, that certificate also uh, had github.io and github.com on it as well. Uh, so their certificate worked for all of GitHub then? Pretty much. Oops. So, uh, you know, he alerted uh, these, you know, uh, I think it was Wo sign about it. And uh, eventually they uh, uh, canceled a certificate, but he, apparently he did did this a few times. And oh, to see if they fixed the problem. Yeah, and they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, another thing that uh, they had going on was, you know, how SHA-1 is sort of like horrendously insecure mm -hmm. or allegedly horrendously insecure. Um, that's uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, the agreement among the certificate authorities uh, was that you should not issue SHA-1 certificates past, you know, January 1st, 2016. So to get around this, we'll sign backdated certificates. Ah, I see. And that, oh, we signed this already. And I think it's that uh, that little fact is what Mozilla is really angry about. It's a kind of a messed up thing. Companies like purposely. <laughs> It was like, oh, uh, we didn't actually create it today. We created it a year ago. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> I mean, what's a time machine, you know, between friends, right? So given the place where, yeah, given the place where it's from China and their, their, uh, their love of spying on their citizens, it's kind of an interesting thing, uh, their location stuff. Because I, I just scanning their article that mentioned, like, Something about certificates for Google domains that they were used to eavesdrop on Iranian citizens, and it seems like maybe there's more to this company than just that they're sloppy. It sounds almost like they're intentionally doing things to give them an advantage and people that pay the money an advantage. It almost seems like that way. So, um, uh, the the thing of it is, is that Startcom uh, was like the only way to get. Uh, uh, free SSL certificates before Let's Encrypt. Ah, so and, they've done quite a few then. So uh, another thing is that uh, WoSign actually bought Startcom, so that's why they're sort of in this together. Um, like I remember uh, trying to get a Startcom certificate a few years ago, and I cried and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might have not understood how it how like uh public key infrastructure even worked too well but it was not easy <laughs> so um yeah you know how uh websites and stuff uh use usernames and passwords yes um apparently uh startcom's website didn't use those what did it use it used public private keys like sort of like you know how ssh uses uh uh, public and private keys yeah. for client authentication. Uh huh. Uh, well, apparently browsers have that feature too, and that's what Startcom uses. It says they're a certificate company. They're like, it's cool to not use passwords, guys. Let's just use certificates instead. So uh, that's uh, that's the only website that I know of that has ever used uh, like public private keys. <laughs> that's funny. So, I mean, hey, I mean, all of this is more secure and stuff. Like, you know. Uh, anyways, so have you ever used PG Admin 3? I'm not sure about 3, but it's vaguely familiar. Like, I think I installed it on a Linux box once upon a time in, in previous days when I would play with databases and stuff like that. Well, when I was younger. Well, PG Admin 4 has been released, and now it's a web app. It's a web app? Yes. Nice. So, um, apparently it's driven by a Python backend, 
but uh, apparently it also has a desktop client, uh, just like it used to. So is the desktop client really just a web front end um, on the website, I wonder? I'm pretty sure it's not. Okay. Because it, it actually has, like, QT and stuff in it. Okay. So, um, you yeah, know, let's see. Unfortunately, the actual official website doesn't exactly have, uh, uh, like, like any kind of, you know, nice features mm. or anything. But uh, more could come. What's interesting is I'm seeing a trend of more and more companies using uh, Python for for code, which is uh, kind of reverse. Using Python code. three for Python three. Okay, <laughs> so even like uh, FreeCAD, the CAD design software I'm using, that I think is pretty heavy in the Python. Uh, you've heard me uh, complain before that gigabit uh, Ethernet is just too slow. I know your internet speed is almost. <laughs> oh. Oh, my my match. internet my internet speed is almost fifteen percent of my land speed. Help me, please. I know. <laughs> um, so uh, the thing is is that uh, ten gigabit Ethernet uh, has been around for like ten years, and yet there has been practically zero penetration in the uh, how should I say like the normal home and uh, office market. So we're all puttering along with gigabit Ethernet, wondering when something better will come along. Uh, well, it was just, uh, in fact, on October 3rd or so that the nbase T standard, uh, or IEEE 802.3BZ, has uh, been approved. And what this is, is 2.5 and 5 gigabit Ethernet over twisted copper wires. And it also has uh, features for power over Ethernet as well. So, like, you know, all those routers and access points that advertise, like, 1,300 megabits per second. Mm -hmm. Like, actual gigabit speeds, like, over gigabit speeds. Which, like, if you're just, like, one guy using it, you're not going to get anywhere that fast. But if you, say, have a living room with full of iPads and everyone's using them, then it might slow down a little bit. So in order to rectify this, you need to have like actual faster backend to that. Yes. So this is where, uh, you know, things that are faster than gigabit ethernet, but are not as costly as 10 gigabit ethernet come into play. Uh, plus if it's power over ethernet, you can just run your power over that and just have one wire going to your uh, access point. So one thing I didn't really notice in the article is if they were planning to use like a uh, cat five or six cable still, or if they had plans to do different cable. Okay. So it looks like cat five E will be sufficient for the 2.5 gigabit and they recommend six or six a for the five gigabit speeds. Uh, so, like, again, uh, like, 10 gigabit Ethernet requires, like, better cabling, mm -hmm. like, especially shielded cabling uh, for, like, like especially long runs, but apparently it will do just fine for, like, 100 feet over, I think, 6A. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a sort of cost-effective measure of using existing cabling where possible. Yes, which is always a plus. You don't want to hear rip off a wire at it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, especially like fishing wires through walls and stuff, uh -huh. which I actually looked into at this apartment. But then the uh, landlord's like, yeah, like oh, pretty much all of these walls are concrete. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, fun. <laughs> so I'm like, OK, well, is there like some way you can uh, like drill a hole through like the stairway? It's like apparently that's concrete, too. <laughs> So, yeah, this place is built like a bunker. So you should be good from the radiation during the nuclear war. <laughs> just Yeah, just stay away from the windows. Yes, yeah, stay away from the windows. Yes, windows is toxic. Don't use windows. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, uh, 
lately I've... Uh, Remember to speak into the Microsoft. Speak into the Microsoft. I, okay, I was going to say I haven't used Microsoft for a long time. Then I remembered that I actually was at work. Apparently we're still using Windows and Visual Studio. That should tr- I should try the, the, the whole Community Edition Linux thing sometime. If I can connect to the VPN, then I could connect up in... The, the mono could be shady, though, if I won't have to run the app. Anyways, for fun. You, you could use the uh, Linux subsystem for Windows. You could, but that's still not quite the same way. Plus, we don't have <laughs> Windows 10. A.K.A. Wine. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I reversed it the wrong direction. Yeah, you, you could use Wine. That's true. Maybe. I bet it actually would work with our app. I, I bet it would. If all else fails, a virtual machine. Yes, that's true, too. And anyways. Anyways, uh, lately... For fun besides blacksmithing and making a pair of tongs, uh, I've been uh, starting to print a CNC machine with my printer. It's called Root to CNC. I found it on Thingiverse. It looks pretty simple. It just has uh, some the X and Y axis is made out of uh, square aluminum tubing, and uh, you print uh, some parts out for the base. And then you have a couple pieces of plywood uh, for the base, and then you have two side. Uh, pieces that uh, some other plastic parts put onto uh, and it doesn't look too difficult to build so I've been starting to print it and buying random things off of eBay uh, in China where the shipping is going to take a month to get here but that's okay because the printing is taking a very long time but it's not too bad so anyways yeah having fun with uh, printing lots of stuff so you're you're actually printing stuff to make a printer Yes, because a CNC machine of this type is actually really a big 3D printer, as some people have said. Which, yeah, it is. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and with this big 3D printer, uh, as you might call it, you could CNC other things, such as maybe parts for a bigger CNC. I heard one guy say that uh, you could make a bigger one that holds a router, apparently, and make an even better one. So it's a series of machines that can build bigger and better machines. Yes. That can build bigger and better stuff until finally... You are are bootstrapping your own manufacturing. That's right. I'm bootstrapping my own manufacturing. I actually have a concept in my mind of this factory that I'll build. It's going to be fully autonomous. It would be an assembly line, and it would make, like, everything. And then at the end of the line, there would be these boxes... And the robot will wheel out a cart in the boxes and wait there and load it on the truck for the up sky. So, and then you'll have factories that will make factories that will make more factories. Yes, this is such a great idea. Infinite loop. <laughs> the meta factory. And then someday the earth will be overpopulated with my factories. <laughs> because my factories have no purpose in life other than to make other factories. And they will have forgotten the real purpose in life and be so cluttered with it that they would decide that people must go so we can build more factories and then they'll get the then they'll get to the end and get depressed they might but i mean hey what's more beautiful than an earth full of factories if you're a factory building robot (laughs) uh that was fun so Anyways, uh, if you would like to submit feedback to the show, you can do so on the Nexus.tv, maybe even while looking at the show notes. And for the first time in a long time, please do not forget, like I have for a while, that today is International Backup Awareness Day. So back up all your stuff, like I have been doing anyway. Have you been backing up things? I typically use Dropbox and float between computers to computers, so the stuff I care about tends to be on the Dropbox. Ah, good enough. <laughs> that That's basically my been my philosophy. Just put it in the cloud and yet let other people store it for me. And then when hackers steal it, guess what? I have a redundant copy. <laughs> <laughs> Although, if you really care, you should probably copy it off into other places too. Probably. So, um, anyways, uh, it seems that my website has a little caching problem. Caching problem. It's 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 hoarding too much cash. Um, in a way, or it's costing too much money to run. Not not money cash. Oh, not money cash. Okay, I'm talking about like certain web browsers. Oh, Chrome. 
kind of zealously keep my page and not update it as often as it should. Would this be in regard to CSS or something like that? Um, no, it's in regards to comments. Uh -huh. So uh, if you go directly to one of my articles, like say directly from my RSS feed, it'll say refresh the page and wait three seconds to post a comment. So that's sort of like my anti-spam thing. I remember you telling me about this. So this is a link that if you click on it, it's supposed to refresh the page. And you keep clicking on it. And it doesn't do because anything. Because like, why on earth would you want to refresh the page? That's stupid. So does Chromium do any better? I doubt it. Uh, where's your I want to leave comments? Okay. Do you have to go to an article? Yes. Oh, okay. But here it'll show. It will Refresh show the page. Wait, wait, wait. You have a note at the bottom of your page. that says, if you're still getting this message, make sure you have cookies and JavaScript enabled, and you run NoScript on your own personal browser, you tell people to enable JavaScript? Okay, so so if you just saw that, uh, let's see, I'll do it again. I'll open up a new private window in Firefox, and, you know, uh -huh. it'll say that, and then you click it, and, oh, you got the comment form. Very nice. So, uh, the thing about that is, I would like to fix it, but my... Uh, development virtual machine does not want to cooperate with uh, my web server right now and is absolutely refusing to spit out any kind of web page. So uh, it looks like I'm going to have to have to nuke my virtual machine and start over, which is fine because it's kind of designed that way. <laughs> the important things come out of the virtual machine and can be put back in. So um, anyways... Uh, it looks like I have that to fix, and as mentioned, uh, this is a pretty nice week, so I will be using the tea uh, to go to work, which means I will be walking about an hour every day. Very nice. And uh, let's see, I'm not, I know that you went to the Greek food festival down at the church next to uh, uh, Cannonsburg. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you ever been to the one up here? I doubt it, because I think that was the only Greek food place I've ever been to, as mm. far as, like, a church place like that. Okay, uh, so apparently the one uh, across from the Galleria is having uh, that this week, so it looks like uh, tomorrow and Friday I will be maybe walking down there and having some Greek food. Very nice. Which is about an hour walk away. I so I was gonna, my next question was, how far is that? Because... I was thinking that through, that's like down 19, so you'd have to walk out to 19, then and then down you'd have to walk a lot. down. So you're looking at two hours. You better eat a lot when you get there, <laughs> because you're going to be burning a lot. Which is kind of the point. So you're not going to ride your bike? Uh, no, because that means I'd have to ride all the way back. Okay. And uh, granted, I might, if I were crazy, I would try it. But then again, it'd be kind of at night as well. And also, literally all the way back would be uphill. Uh, I'll give you at night. It sounds like a safety issue, so I'll, I'll give you a pass on that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm really only acclimated to get here from the T station. Okay. So, uh, as opposed to, like, yet another hundred or two feet uh, going uphill. So, yeah. Uh, anything exciting happening with you? Uh, or at least looking forward to? At least looking forward to, hmm. Okay, there's something. I am playing, a uh, Form of Brick Wars with, uh, some of my friends this Saturday. I, I played the first round, like, a month ago. The, he's my friend from college, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of, kind of having fun with that. Uh, it, it's fun because he's cre got a creative mind, so, Yeah. So, uh, well, since you've been talking about playing things, I am playing my way through The Witcher 3 uh, for hopefully a review at some point. So um, hopefully I might actually be able to you know, sit down and uh, write up a review of Diablo before that, which is kind of a Halloween uh, kind of game. That's that old DOS one you showed me the one time, right? Where you go into fighting things and stuff in the dungeon. Uh, not quite DOS, but yeah, kind of like 1995-ish. Yeah. 
So, um... Well, 95 ran on DOS, so you're really in DOS the whole time. Well, yeah, if you really break down Windows 95, you'll find DOS, but it runs on Windows 95. It runs on Windows 95, which is running inside of DOS. But it actually needs Windows 95 in order to run. True, it is a dependency. So, yeah. Uh, and I would not be surprised if you could run it on modern Windows as well. Perhaps. So, uh, anyways, I think that's it. So do you want to do the closing since you did the opening? Have a good one!